I want to invite everybody to open up to the Old Testament book of Ruth. That's where we're going to be at this morning. So go ahead and open up to the book of Ruth. That's where we'll read beginning and a little bit towards the middle part. That's where we'll be at as we kick off this morning's sermon. It's, I'd like to echo what was said by Clint earlier. It's so good to have everybody out with us. We have almost a full house. We have some visitors with us, but we also have several of our members that are back with us, which is always good. We unfortunately have several that are out for various reasons, and so we want to make sure we keep those people in our prayers, certainly. We did not plan, despite what you may think about how this sermon is going to go, Levi and I did not plan this worship service this morning. He sent me the songs this morning, and as I was looking at them, especially the song right before the lesson, I thought, well, this is just going to be perfect. And so I have to give him kudos for a great random selection. He had about 793 songs he could chose. The most perfect one out of the songbook was the one that came right before this. That song, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, you may know the story behind it. But the story of the song is, is that there was a minister in the 18th century who was in a very small congregation in the middle of rural England. And he was not well known, and I say that accommodatively, obviously. He's not somebody who's super well known. But a minister at a big congregation in London, that minister had actually died. And so they reached out to this minister. They said, would you be willing to come to us? This guy had been there for 20 or 30 years in this rural area. And he said, absolutely, this is a great opportunity for me to kind of meet new people and go out and visit some other places. And so he accepted. Well, on the morning that he was due to go out there, he actually, everybody kind of led, I think the whole church kind of led one by one past him, and they told him how much they were going to miss him. And he ended up staying because of the love that he had for that congregation. This is not my exit sermon, by the way, in case you thought that was the similarity there. But he wrote the song, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, as a result of that moment. Because he realized that what he was leaving and what he was going to was was really, really kind of tough for him. He realized that he had formed a connection with the people that were there that superseded just about anything else that he could find anywhere else. And so he stayed there and finished his preaching career at that congregation. And the reason that ties really well in with my sermon, and this is what I put up earlier this week, so there's no way we could have planned this. I hopped on Facebook a couple weeks ago and realized that this is actually the 14th anniversary of me being here. I don't feel that old. I don't know if you can tell my gray hair is, is kind of starting to show through. But 14 years ago, I had posted this on Facebook that said, it's official, I'm the new preacher at Hillside Church of Christ in Greenville. Ken, I think, put a thumbs down on that. I don't know what his involvement there. But that was 14 years ago. And so I realized that I have been here, and this was a real shocker. I've been at this congregation longer than I lived in Amarillo growing up, which is a really weird thing for me to conceptualize and imagine in my life. That means that you've been putting up with me for almost 14 years at this point. And as I thought through that idea, just memories that came flooding back over the last 14 years, what I realized is we really have something here that I think is noteworthy. And over the last 14 years, what I've realized, and this is the point of the whole sermon, is that we really have a spiritual family here that I think is tight-knit and is very close. There are a lot of churches that you go visit. There's a lot of churches that maybe you've been a part of in the past where it didn't really seem like you were part of a family. It felt like you were there and that you were there and worshiping and you took the Lord's Supper together and you gave your money, you sang your songs, your prayer, but it didn't really ever seem like a family. As soon as the closing prayer was said, everybody was out the door in less than three or four minutes, mainly because they wanted to make it to Taco Bell and time to beat everyone else there for lunch, but it just seemed like there was no real energy, and I use that word very loosely, but there wasn't a whole lot of love there, and I really feel like we have that. And that led me to think about the power of spiritual family just in general, about how it seems like when we start talking about the bond that we have through Christ, it is something that far supersedes anything you or I have with physical family, it's certainly more than we have sometimes with our hobbies. It just seems to be greater than anything else we have on this, on this earth. If you look in Ruth, the first chapter, this is not the small church, in case you're wondering. That's not what's happening here. But you have a very, I would argue, similar situation. Ruth chapter 1, you have a, a series of very unfortunate events in the first five verses where three women move to a different land. All three of their husbands have passed away. And so starting in Ruth chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, Then she arose, talking about Naomi, it says, Then she arose with her daughter-in-laws that she might return from the land of Moab. For she had heard in the land of Moab that the people, or the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was. And her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on to the way to return to the land of Judah. Naomi, to her credit, and I say that, absolutely true to her credit verse 8 Naomi says to her daughters-in-law go and return each of you to your mother's house may the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me may the Lord grant you that you may find a rest each in the house of her husband that's a very serious statement because what Naomi knows as an older widow is she knows that her future 
looks pretty bleak. As a matter of fact, if you fast forward to the end of Ruth, when she eventually comes back to Moab or comes back to her homeland, they look at her and they say, here comes blessed Naomi. She says, don't call me blessed, call me cursed. Because of the things that has happened to me and the bleakness of my future, you younger widows who still can bear children, who still can do all the things in your life that you're going to do, you have a future ahead of you. Naomi doesn't. And so it says in verse 10 that they said to her, no, but we will surely return with you to your people. Orpah and Ruth, they say, we'll follow you. Naomi says, return my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may also be your husbands? Return my daughters for go. I'm too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight, also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they are grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters. For it is harder for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. Now listen to this in verse 14. They lifted up their voices and they wept again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. I find that an incredibly endearing verse. Because what you have here in this situation is you have Naomi who looks at her two daughters-in-law, her ex-daughters-in-law, whatever you want to call them, and says, there is no future for me in this world. And of course she does, but that's the way she's looking at the situation. She says, I have no more future for me in this world. You two ladies absolutely can build a life for yourself. The best thing for you girls is to go and get married and do your own thing. Orpah takes her up on it, understandably so. But Ruth hitches her wagon directly to Naomi and says in that immortal phrase right after this, where you go, I will go. Where you are buried, that's where I'm going to be buried. Your God will be my God if anything but death parts you from me. Why does somebody make a decision like that? Why do you make a decision at that point in your life, as Ruth did, to completely align yourself with a woman who, for all intents and purposes, has been completely abandoned by God? Why do you make that decision? And moreover, why do you, as verse 14 talks about, why do you cling to her? And You could argue that in a situation like what we have in today's world, it's very, very similar. A lot of us have come from different walks of life. We didn't know each other until we arrived through these doors. And we walk through these doors. We meet these people. We look at them. We say, these are my people. That's who I'm going to associate with. This band of Christians that meets at Hillside, that's what I'm going to be a part of. Why would you make that decision? I know for a fact that at one point within your life, that was intentional. That you decided, for better or for worse, this is a group that I want to identify with. And so I would argue that the power of our spiritual family, ladies and gentlemen, is dependent then on how intentional I am with these relationships. It's not enough for me to just walk through the door, align myself with the church and say, here I am. We have to be constantly willing to grow our local congregation, to be invested, to be intentional with the people that we are with. After all, that's what all of us are here doing. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 says that this is essentially the goal when it says that our desire is to stir one another up into love and good works. I look at you, you look at me. How can we grow together? And so the real power of the spiritual family that we have here at Hillside, besides God, who is the all power for everything, but that power is dependent on how intentional I am with these relationships. And so I'll ask you this morning as we kick off this lesson, that was my introduction in case you're wondering, how intentional are you with these relationships? How intentional are you when you walk through the door this morning on Wednesday nights? How intentional are you with developing the relationships with people across the room? And I would imagine like most people, you think, well, obviously I'm contributing. I'm very intentional. These people are close to me. I'm close to them. They are some of my best friends, at least in certain respects. I care about them deeply. I love them. And if that is the case with you, then that's great. But I want to throw up three questions this morning that may get you to actually think a little deeper about that subject. First and foremost, I guess the first question would help. Do we actually spend time together? And I know that this is kind of a loose question because I think obviously the answer is, well, yes, we go to Friday night football games. After all, we go to eat lunch after Sunday morning services. We have each other over for Super Bowl part. We do all these amazing things. And so obviously, yes, we spend time together. Now, I will grant you that it's a little bit harder in terms of, in today's world, when we start talking about digital relationships, because so much of our life can be manifested online. We can establish relationships online. We can keep tabs on each other online. And so we think to ourselves, convincingly so, I'm investing in you because, after all, we're Facebook friends. I follow you on Instagram. I'm a part of the Hillside Group. So obviously, we're invested in each other's relationships. I don't know if that's really the case always. Ask yourself the question, when was the last time you initiated plans with somebody else inside the congregation? Not waiting to be asked, but when was the last time you initiated plans with somebody else inside the congregation? 
I think that is a really sobering question sometimes for us. There's a church that I know of in Dallas, and I love that they do this. Every summer they do what's called their summer road trip. And the preacher gets up and talks about our summer road trip begins today. And it's not any actual road trip. I don't know if you can get everybody in a caravan that long. But every summer what they do is every single person rotates inside the auditorium. Not does a circle, but they may sit in the back. They may sit up in the front. They may sit in the middle. The whole point of it is to get to know people that you don't always sit next to. Because after all, if I spend all my time sitting next to Brandon Parrish, the only person I'm going to know in this building is Brandon Parrish. That's great, by the way. I like you. But I don't know the rest of you people. And so how intentional are we in spending time with each other? You see this right afterwards in Ruth chapter 1 and verse 15. Listen to what happens here in Ruth chapter 1, starting in verse 15. It says, Then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law, this is Naomi talking to Ruth. She said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God shall be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me and worse, if anything, but death parts you and me. And when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. We use this and I use this in marriage sermons all the time. If I've done your sermon, or if I've done your wedding ceremony, which I know there are a few people here, you've probably heard that. But she's not talking in a marriage sense. She's talking about in a working together sense. And as you extrapolate the rest of the book of Ruth outwards, you can see that. Every single place Naomi goes, Ruth is right there. Every place Ruth goes, Naomi is right there. Does that define our relationship that we have? Look, if you would, in Luke, the eighth chapter. There's a power there that I think is really significant. In Luke, the eighth chapter, starting in verse 34. This comes on the back end of a really interesting story. This is the story where you have the guy that's possessed with a legion of demons, which I cannot even imagine seeing that, feeling that, whatever that is. But at the end of this, in verse 32, it says, there was a herd of many swine feeding there on the mountains. The demons implored Jesus, this is part of his healing areas, implored him to permit them to enter the swine. He gave them permission. The demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank and the lake and was drowned. What a scene that would have been that day. But then in verse 34, it says, When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they ran away and reported it in the city and out in the country. The people went out to see what had happened. And this, listen to this. They came to Jesus, found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting down at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they became frightened. It's literally the only time in Scripture where somebody that's acting normal scares everybody else. And yet that's what's happening here. The man who is possessed with this legion of demons is just sitting there listening. Verse 36, those who had seen it, Reported to them how the man who was, was demon-possessed had been made well. All the people of the country, verse 37, country of the Gerasenes and the surrounding districts, asked him to leave them, for they were gripped with great fear. Jesus got into a boat and returned. On the other hand, verse 38, the man from whom the demons had gone out was begging him that he might accompany him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. You see a lot of this happening in Scripture sometimes. And you see it, especially with Jesus, obviously, when you have these healing moments. But you have these situations where it seems like these people just cannot get away from Jesus. There's that amazing scene where you have the woman who has the hemorrhage for a decade. And she's reaching out to Jesus. And she says, if I can only touch the hem of his cloak, then I'll be clean. And Jesus, walking through the cloud, or crowd, feels it and says, where did that come from me? I felt power leave me. Where, who touched me? And the woman says, well, obviously it was me. And she says, would you please heal me? Jesus said, it is not good for us to throw the scraps from the dinner table and give it to the dogs. And the woman begs, says, even the dogs eat the scraps. Just let me be a dog in your presence. And you have a similar thing happening here. Where a man who has been demon possessed for years is healed and begs Jesus to stay. Let me just stay with you, Jesus. It's the same exact attitude you have in Ruth chapter 1, verse 15, when Ruth begs and clings to Naomi. Why is it that we cling to each other? Why is it that we constantly desire to be next to each other when it seems like we have so many other people in this world that we can hang out with? I think a lot of it comes with our mutual trust with each other. If you've ever walked or if you've ever traveled and you've gone to some other part of the country or other part of the state or whatever it is, and you meet somebody else that's from Greenville, 
automatically you can tell in their twang. that We have that notorious twang within our voices. You can just tell. But immediately when you see somebody that you recognize that's from the same area, there's a little bit of, a little bit of trust built into them. And the same exact scenario relays itself within the church. You could travel to the opposite side of the planet and you meet somebody who is a Christian and you automatically feel somewhat at home with those people because of the trust that is built into what we commonly believe. And so it's for that reason why these relationships that we have inside of our local church or the universal church need to be nurtured. And so I ask you this question again, are we spending time with each other? Are we actually initiating and investing inside of each other? Because if not, I would argue we're missing out one of the greatest strengths that we have as Christians. Here's a second question for you. How do I respond to division? Hopefully you don't say with both arms swinging, because that's not the idea that I'm getting at there. But how do you respond to division inside of your local church? In the last 14 years, we have had a number of different situations, some of which have become public, some of which have not become public. But we've had a number of scenarios inside this local congregation that I would argue, had they had more teeth, could have divided the church right down the middle. Some of you may be aware of some of these different situations. And the tendency sometimes with these situations that pop up is immediately to draw sides and to go opposite with each other and say, you stay over there, I'm over here, and we're just going to duke it out. And whoever wins gets the parking lot. That's not the attitude that anybody has. If I had that attitude with my wife, if I had that attitude with my spouse or my children, if I had that attitude with anybody, then no relationship would last longer than five seconds. Keeping in Luke, if you look a couple chapters back in chapter 6, starting in verse 27, Jesus gives an amazing sense of the attitude we should have towards each other. And then he gives the reason for it on the back end. He says in Luke 6, verse 27, I say to you here, or so say to you who hear, in other words, those of you who are paying attention, who want to listen what Jesus has to say. He says, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. Whoever takes your shirt or coat, do not withhold your shirt from him. Give to everyone who asks you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat others the same way that you want them to treat you. That's jarring for a lot of us who immediately bow up and say, you take something from mine, I'm going to take twice back from you. And yet the reason is given here in verse 32. He says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. If you lend to those who expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. Love your enemies, do good, verse 35, and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you'll be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. There's a difference there in the way we treat each other. If I'm punched in the face metaphorically, if something is stolen from me, if I'm mistreated, then I repay not with evil, not with anger, but with kindness. That seems opposites of what we see in this world. But in verse 36, the likeness of Christ, the likeness of God is seen in our actions. Verse 36, be merciful just as your father is merciful. That application extends to us when we're dealing with conflict inside the church. And it may be that we're dealing with a situation right now. Maybe you are. Maybe I don't know about it. But maybe you're dealing with a situation inside this congregation right now where you're on the verge of saying, you know what? If this guy stays, I'm gone. And I would encourage you to pump the brakes on that and ask yourself, Is there a way that I can be merciful in this situation? Because after all, if I truly am molded in the image of Christ and he was merciful, then shouldn't I also be merciful? Shouldn't I also seek to reconcile that situation so that instead of a split and anger where we both go our separate ways and then later we sing about how I surrender all to Jesus, when we go our separate ways, we actually build those relationships back up. I thought it was interesting. There was a study that came out a few years ago, and there were several different outlets that picked it up in different places. But it talked about the role that hostile mediators play in conflict resolution. And what it was saying was is that they took people who had severe issues inside of their relationship. Some of these people were married. Some of these people had just been friends before. They all volunteered to be a part of the study. And so when these people came into the study, they put them in a room, and instead of bringing in a therapist, which talks to them in very simple and accommodative tones, let's all talk through these things, they brought in what's called a hostile mediator. 
And the hostile mediator walked into the room and immediately started listening to what they were saying and then started calling them names. And I won't use these names because we have people that are under four here and I will get called out for it later. But they said things like, you guys are acting like big meanie heads. You guys are not acting very nice. You guys are angry and I don't like you and I don't like you. And an interesting thing happened as a result of this study. These two people who had been in conflict with each other then united in their attacks on the therapist. And so what it showed was in that systems of great stress and conflict, all these different things, when the people found a common enemy instead of seeing each other as the enemy, then they were able to move forward in their relationship. And I think the same principle applies inside the church. If we're looking at each other as being the enemy, person on pew three, that's the enemy, then we're not united in our real enemy, which is Satan which is the world. It's one of the main reasons why I think evangelism is the number one thing that can cure most most church divisions in the world is because we're united against a common enemy. We're united and work towards a similar goal. In Luke, the 11th chapter, flip over there if you would, if you're still in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 14. Jesus was accused of a lot of things, and this is one of the most nonsensical ones. But in Luke, the 14th chapter, starting in verse 14, it says, He was casting out a demon, and it was mute. And when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke. The crowds were amazed. That happens a lot in the Gospels. But some of them said, well, he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Others, to test him, were demanding of him a sign from heaven. And he knew their thoughts. And he said to them, and Abraham Lincoln said this later, but Jesus was the original person. He said, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And a house divided against itself falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I by Beelzebul cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? So they will then be your judges. If I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. If, however, a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from his all his armor which he had relied and distributes his plunder. He who is not with me, verse 33, is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. It's a very simple principle. The only way in which we will succeed as a church, as a unit, as a group, as a relationship, the only way in which we succeed is if we work together. And if we are sitting in this room sniping at each other, or if two people who are in a relationship are constantly tearing each other down, then there's no outward focus. Somebody will win that relationship. Somebody will win that argument. And every single other person will lose. And so I ask you, how do you respond to division? You may think as soon as that person walks out the door, I won, look at me. But look at the wake of collateral damage. If, however, I respond as God does, which is merciful, which is kindness, then everybody wins. This one might throw you for a shocker. I know I have three points in every lesson, so you knew this one was coming. But this one might not have been what you were expecting. Do I have goals for other people? You may not know it, but I have goals for you. I have goals for Colin, a lot of goals for Colin. Nathan, goals for you guys, goals for everybody. Eleonora has goals for me, and I feel like I miss them regularly. But we all have goals for each other. And you may be sitting here saying, well, I don't have any goals for anybody. After all, I'm too busy trying to think of myself and and take my life and handle my own life. So I don't have any goals for anybody else. Yes, you do. Because you and I both know that when somebody acts in a way that isn't becoming of them, you know what you always say? I expected more from you. And so regardless of your response to this situation, I know that you have goals for other people. That when you look at other people, you think to yourself, how can I help them improve? And this goes back to Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and 25. When you walk into the assembly, do you think to yourself, how can I stir up Joe to love and good works? How can Joe stir up me? How can me and Steve work for the kingdom together? How can we grow together? You look at Proverbs chapter 23, this is exactly the way these relationships are supposed to be. Proverbs chapter 23, starting in verse 13. And keep in mind, the first verse is about children. Overall, it's about growth. Proverbs chapter 23, starting in verse 13. It says, do not hold back discipline from the child. You'll strike him with the rod, but he's not going to die. You'll strike him with the rod and rescue his soul from shield. That's the importance of discipline in general. My son, if your heart is wise, my own heart also will be glad. My inmost being will rejoice when your lips speak what is right. Don't let your heart envy sinners, 
But live in the fear of the Lord always. Surely there is a future. Your hope's not going to be cut off. Listen, my son, and be wise. Direct your heart in the way. Don't be with heavy drinkers of wine or with gluttonous eaters of meat. For the heavy drinker and the glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe one with rags. Listen to your father who begot you, and don't despise your mother when she is old. Buy truth, don't sell it. Get wisdom and instruction, understanding. These are the goals that we have for each other. If you saw somebody inside the church building, not inside the church building, but if you saw somebody from Hillside acting some way that they shouldn't, whether that's online or whether that's in person, you would naturally be disappointed with them. And so a lot of times our goals for each other are reactive. We think to ourselves, well, this person didn't do what they should have done, and I'm going to go and fix that. That's not all that our goals should be. As I look around the room right now and I see everybody that's here, and this is not me trying to induce anxiety on you, but as I look around the room right now, I see different people and I I know where you're at roughly in different stages of growth, just like you do. And so I think to myself, this person could evangelize a little more. This person could do more works in public worship. This person could teach Bible class. This person could do these things. And you look at me the same way. Brady could be a better preacher. I could be. I'm trying. But we all have goals for each other. The question is, do we act on those types of goals? We mentioned this on Wednesday night about Jesus' relationship with his brothers, but I think there's a good lesson to be brought from this. If you look, for instance, in Luke, the eighth chapter. Luke chapter eight, there's a nugget right here inside of these relationships that we can miss sometimes if we're not careful. And in Luke, the eighth chapter, starting in verse 19, It says that his mother, talking about Jesus' mother and his brothers, came to him, and they were unable to get to him because of the crowd. And it was reported to him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wishing to see you. But he answered and said to them, and this is one of those passages that's repeated, I think, in three of the four Gospels. So it's not something that they're trying to overlook. It carries weight with the early church. It says, he answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Now that by itself is a lesson. We could just take that three verses and we could say well this is what a spiritual family is to be it's not built on blood but it's built on jesus it's built on obedience built on that but jesus isn't necessarily taking a swipe at these people i don't think that he's looking at his mother and his brothers and he's saying to themselves well these people aren't important to me i think in some way he's trying to prod them into what they should be because if you look at john the seventh chapter you pull back another layer of that onion about jesus's relationships with his brothers And John, the seventh chapter, starting in verse one, it says, after these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now, the feast of the Jews, the feast of booze was near. Therefore, his brother said to him, leave here and go into Judea. Talking about Jesus's physical brothers, the same ones we mentioned there in Luke. It says, leave here and go into Judea so that your disciples also may see your works, which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even, verse 5, his brothers were believing in him. And Jesus said to them, my time is not yet here, but your time is always opportune. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that deeds are evil. Go up to the feast yourselves. I did not go up to the feast because my time has not yet fully come. Having said these things to him, he stayed then in Galilee. Jesus has this interesting confrontation with his brothers where it's well known from verse 1 that everybody is out to kill him, especially in Jerusalem. And his brothers then in verses 3 and 4 say, well, what you should be doing is go to Judea, go to Jerusalem, to the hotbed of Pharisaic activity, and do your works there. That's what you need to be doing. Jesus counters that. In verse 6, he says, why don't you go to the feast? My time hasn't come yet. And then he goes on to talk about the fact that you really need to be doing more. If you, if you really believe in God, if you really trust in him, do these works yourselves. And so Jesus, in a sense, takes their veiled threat if you can call it that maybe i'm taking too many liberties with the text but if you can call it a veiled threat he takes that threat and then he issues it as a challenge to them and i think when you put that up against what we read in luke 8 what jesus understands about his brothers is they're not believing they're not obedient they're not to the point yet where they're fully ready to accept who he is but he wants them to be there you guys who think that you're my brothers because we share the same physical blood possibly you're not really my brothers Because my family is, as he talks about Luke, the ones who do the will of God. And when you move forward in Scripture and you see passages like Galatians chapter 1 and verse 18, which says that Paul didn't see any of the apostles except 
or any, any of the noteworthy Christians except Peter and James, the Lord's brother. You see how his brothers eventually did come around to at least some kind of faith. You look in Acts, the 15th chapter, and you see how James is once again yet one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. You go forward to the book of Jude, and in verse 1, it literally says that he is a brother of James, but also a bondservant of Jesus, which means he's also a brother of Jesus, but he's not willing to admit that. There is growth within his siblings that Jesus prodded and anticipated and told them to go do, just like he did with everybody else in his life. And so I ask you this morning, do you have goals for each other? As you look across the room and you see all these different people that exist in this room and you see them at the stage of life that they are, do you have a goal for them? Do you want them to be better as Christians? Do you want to be better? Are you willing to accept the goals other people have for you? Or do we just kind of sit here and sing songs and we leave and we're not really changed by that? I have a challenge for everybody here this morning. And this is a challenge that involves food. So it's good for everybody. Certainly good for me. But I would challenge everybody here this morning to look at some member of this congregation that you don't really know that well. And I would encourage you to ask them out to lunch today. If you have lunch plans today, that's totally fine. Before you leave, make lunch plans for next Sunday. Because we as a congregation are designed to stick close together so that when we need each other in our times of spiritual trial, we can call on them. But if we don't know the people we worship with, how likely are we to call them for help? How likely are we to lean on them in times of distress when we really need something? How willing are we to follow through on those goals that we have with them, to build them up, to strengthen them? That's our challenge for this morning, to get to know the people that we worship with every Sunday and Wednesday. And if you're here this morning, you're not a Christian, that's the first relationship that you need to be a part of. And I would love to help you with that. Won't you come as we stand and sing?